Okay, so I think we'll get started. I'm uh, Jason Vanatavi. I'm an assistant professor in pediatric urology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, trained at Columbia, um, and then came here for fellowship and stayed on. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for this incredible lecture series when you go and look through all the lectures that have been given. And um, it's an honor to be amongst the other presenters, who, uh, many of whom I look up to and are mentors of mine. Um, for those of you who are planning ahead, you might have thought this talk was on dysfunctional avoiding. We had a last minute change because I know there was a topic already given uh, previously and we didn't want to be redundant. Um, so we changed it to general urinary embryology, which hadn't been uh, a topic done yet. Now, I don't know what turns residents off more, um, dysfunctional avoiding or embryology. So hopefully you'll stick with me for the next 45 minutes. I'm going to try to make it uh, you know, a little bit less focused on the molecular and all the details and more on sort of the high yield points. Um, I think this is an area that is very relevant for the urology in service and written board exams and so hopefully i can hit some some key topics and some points that will help you get some easy uh, low-hanging fruit on the on the exams that you'll be taking also i think you know from a fundamental standpoint the field of embryology i'm um, in the basis of it in the genital urinary tract is important for understanding not only this the normal development but how these pathways can go wrong in abnormal um, in abnormal situations, and that leads to uh, gen uh, these congenital conditions, but also important points for when we're doing surgical repairs on both children and adults. Um, so the field of embryology is constantly changing, as you know, um, um, with novel experimental therapies and treatments uh, or techniques. Uh, we allow for a deeper understanding of, of how these uh, organs and systems are developing on um, a molecular and genetic level. Um, so a lot of this has changed over the past decades and a lot of it will change. So in about 20 years, I expect maybe one third of this talk to actually be relevant, but um, hopefully it'll be, it'll be good for you guys now. Um, so in this landscape, let's not try to get bogged down in too many of the tiny minutiae and the details and the trueliness of some of these genes and just think about the big picture. Um, a lot of the uh, pictures and images taken from this are from the Campbell's chapter written by Dr. John Park, really great chapter um, if you haven't read it yet. Um, and as he says in that chapter, from the urological surgeon's perspective. However, the classic descriptive aspects of anatomic embryology continue to serve as an important reference point from which various congenital problems are solved clinically. So with that, I have no disclosures. Um, here's a brief overview of what we'll be doing today. And these two figures are exactly from that chapter. And uh, my goal is by the end of this to make you not feel so overwhelmed with these pictures. And one thing just to note off the bat, is um, how the timing of these uh, different, the urinary tract and the general tract development overlaps in some of the similar weeks of gestational age. And we'll see that trend and that theme coming up over and over again. So let's start with the kidneys. So all mammals develop three kidneys in intrauterine life. The first two regress, um, and then the last one becomes the permanent kidney. The first two are the pronephrous and the mesonephrous, and then the metanephrous. Um, they all develop from the intermediate mesoderm. Anything that's uh, highlighted in, in red and underlined is something that I think could be easily testable. So those are sort of my hints. And then yell, uh, yellow is something to focus on. Um, so I had to remember the order of this is I just remember pro being first and then it's alphabetical. So meso and then meta. So just sort of alphabetical. The mesonephros, as we'll see, is actually very important in terms of some of the structures it will form as well. Uh, so the pronephros, that first kidney, as the, the notochord and neural tube develop, the mesoderm on either side of the midline differentiates into three subdivisions, um, the paraxial, the intermediate, and the lateral. And it's this intermediate mesoderm that gives rise to paired nephrogenic cords and nephrotomes. Um, and these develop um, cervically. Um, they're called the pronephrous. And this begins about the fourth week of uh, gestation. Uh, of gestation. So the pronephrous, the pronephrous um, again, has no actual function. It's transitory. Um, it's actually analogous to that seen in primitive fish, um, their excretory organ. And there are five to seven of these paired segments near the future neck uh, and thorax in the, in the cervical region. Um, they've completely regressed by about the fifth week. This is a, a, a hagfish, which actually is a primitive fish that uses this pronephrous as its excretory organ. Um, the mesonephric uh, wolvian, also known as the wolvian ducts, um, these then develop. Um, actually, to, um, they are parallel to these nephrogenic cords, um, and they are um, lateral, uh, sorry, they're medial, uh, sorry, uh, lateral to the intermediate mesoderm um, and to the pronephros. And so these start developing in the, in the fourth week of gestation, and they um, 
distally will end up fusing with the primitive cloaca. Um, and there's some thought that this forms a trigone, but we'll get into that in a little bit later. Um, they cannulize um, and they have an excretory capability. Um, again, this is a not um, this, uh, these tubes um, first form. And then from these ducts, you get um, these mesonephros. And the mesonephros are uh, this kidney precursor, as we talked about. It does have an excretory function. Um, and they, uh, <clears throat> they um, form as 40 pairs of these tubules all along the mesonephric uh, ducts. So the ducts form first, and then the tubules will form these pairs. They form in a, ceph in a caudal to cephalad uh, fashion. And they start by the end of the beginning of the fourth week. And as the beginning ones start to form, the actual top ones start to go away. And then they completely regress by the fourth month. Um, again, these don't have any, um, any function in the uh, later um, human life, but they do have some early on. Um, and it's thought that the production of the fluid uh, through these tubes helps keep them open um, and is important. So here we have our first sort of in-service alert and, and a question. So, um, in female embryos, the remnant of the mesonephric ducts, remember that Wolvian duct, uh, persists as the following structures except, now this is not interactive unfortunately, but um, we'll give you the answer here. Um, these are questions that have been on the in-service or the PSAs. So here's the skein duct, so it can form all the other ones. We'll talk about exactly how those can form and where they are, but the Uphofron and the Parafron and the Gartner's duct cysts are all remnants of the mesonephric ducts in females. So the mesonephric or the Wolvian duct um, in the male will eventually form um, the end products of the epididymis and the vas deferens. Now a remnant of this can survive as an appendix of the epididymis. This is a common finding that you'll see um, when you're doing testicular cases, uh, especially in pediatrics, uh, torsions or orchiopexies, and that's uh, a common question that uh, your attending might ask you. So the appendix epididymis is from this Wolvian duct remnant. In the female, um, Gardner's duct and the appendix feculosa are the remnants of the Wolvian duct. Otherwise, it regresses completely. The tubules themselves, um, so again, the excretory function of these tubules are form this S-shaped, almost like a primitive nephron. And so these tubules in the male, they persist as the afferent ductules of the testes. And we'll talk about them and where they connect um, later. And there's can be a remnant called the paradidymis or the organ of Giraldus. In females, um, these pers can persist as the evifron in the broad ligament or the parafron. And so these are the, the remnants, again, just to remember, and they're sort of homologous, all dealing with the mesonephric system. The definitive kidney, um, or the final kidney, is the uh, metanephros. And so this forms in the sacral region. Again, as paired eutheric buds start to develop off of the distal mesonephric or the Wolvian duct. So important key point here is that the eutheric buds, which are going to form um, the collecting system, come off of the mesonephric or the Wolvian duct. So just keep that one in mind as well. So this eutheric bud, which I'll initial UV um, during this talk, comes in contact with what's called the blastema of the metanephric uh, mesokine. And this happens around the fourth week of gestation. Um, this, um, this action, um, we'll, we'll see in a little bit, is very important. Where this eutheric bud, um, uteric, ureteric bud, comes off of the mesonephric duct is gonna be uh, important. And uh, it contacts, and between the eutheric bud and the metanephric mesokine, there are several interactions that occur and genes that are involved and molecules that are important for their, their development. So these mesenchymal uh, epithelial interactions are important, not just in the development of the kidney, but as we'll see later development of the bladder. Um, so anytime there's interaction between a mesenchymal body or stroma and then an epithelial interaction, there's crosstalk and there are molecules going from one side to the other and, and back and forth that are inducing um, both, both parts. So as this uh, UV divides and it starts to branches, each um, new ampulla is going to have a condensation of metanephric mesokine, um, and then these are going to eventually form the nephrons. Again, so this interaction is really important. There are some um, studies that were done in the past where they separated them out by, uh, by a filter, and if you didn't allow certain molecules to go past uh, the filter from one side to the other, you actually could prevent uh, branching as well as nephron development. Um, so we've talked a little bit about that first part there. Again, this is all between about three and uh, the end of the fifth week gestation. So in terms of these interactions, the metanephric mesenchyme is going to form the nephron from the glomerulus. 
the proximal tubule, lupal handle, henle, and the distal tubule, the uteric bud, and that collecting, forms a collecting system all the way to the collecting ducts. So the collecting ducts, the calyxes, the pelvis, um, and the ureter. And again, there's an interaction between these two, condensation, the extracellular matrix, and then branching and dividing. Here's a picture of some of those genes that are involved. Um, and so there are three, you know, it used to be thought that there was two cell types. It was the mesenchymal cells uh, and then the uteric bud, but there actually are these consents blastema cells. And then there's also some stroma or interstitial mesenchymal cells that have been more, um, sort of more investigated uh, more recently in the last couple of decades. And so in these, um, we know that there are several genes and several um, molecules that are really important. Um, the RET signaling pathway, um, is, is one of these areas that is important. Um, anything that disrupts um, this can, uh, can affect, obviously, development of the kidney. Um, it's important to remember because this is happening pretty early in development. Um, and so anything that can affect um, any of these uh, expressions of these genes can affect kidney development and lead to abnormalities in that. Um, the um, two genes to, to keep in mind for the tubular mesenchymal cells are, are WIND1, um, WNT1, and PATS2. Um, those are, are, are very important in, in developing, again, the, the nephron. And then there are also some adhesion molecules that are also important. Um, so this, um, this bud development um, is uh, a dichotomous branching phenomenon. And so you basically have a constant branching of this bud um, into the, the blastemia, the mesenchyme. The first nine branches are done by the 15th week, and then it's completely finished by the 20th to 25th week. Um, it's important to know this and remember this because the, um, the first uh, few branches, the fifth, uh, first five branches are gonna actually coalesce into basically the renal pelvis, and then the sixth is the major calyx, and the seventh branch are the minors, and then you have the collecting ducts. Now by the end of the, the 20, 25 weeks of branching, you actually have about one to three million um, collecting tubules um, that are eventually form nephrons. Now even though these, the branching is done and you've made all the collecting tubules that you eventually have, these nephrons are developing continuously and actually will continue to develop even after birth. So nephrogenesis um, continues to happen, but the branching phenomenon is finished by about 22 weeks. Um, getting back again to the metanephrus, so this is the definitive kidney. Um, the older um, nephrons are actually, um, and the more differentiated ones are located in the inner part of the kidney, and the newer or the less differentiated nephrons are more in the periphery. Um, this creates a lobular-like effect. Um, and again, we talked about um, the fact that um, even though this is done in gestation, the branching, they will continue to mature. Rematurity takes place postnatally. It's important to remember because the, the pediatric kidneys um, don't concentrate urine as well, and they don't function as well because the kidney is still maturing um, after birth. Um, they also, the kidneys, especially in the kidneys from a, a premature infant, may look a little echogenic, a little bit bright. Um, this probably has to do a little bit also with the fact that these kidneys haven't matured as much. So that gets us through this part now. So we have the top and the bottom part on the left side. So renal scent. Um, so the precise um, mechanism responsible for renal ascent is not really known. What we do know is that the kidneys start out in a lumbar position, um, oh, sorry, they, they start out in the pelvic um, and they will ascend to a lumbar position somewhere below the adrenals between six and eight weeks of gestation. Um, as these kidneys rise, there's a succession of transient aortic branches, uh, first inferior ones that regress and then they keep going, gaining these, um, these aortic branches of vascular supply as the kidneys go up. It's important to remember this because if there's persistence of any of these inferior pole accessory arteries, you could have um, multiple renal arteries and even an inferior pole artery, which can lead to UPJ obstruction. Um, and so here you can see that there is persistence of an inferior pole um, artery, renal artery, and that this can lead to some obstruction at the UPJ. Um, there are a couple theories on how this, uh, the vascular and the ascent of the kidneys occur. It's not really important to remember the details, but there's one thought that they come off of the aorta, where there's another thought that these vessels develop actually from internally from the uh, mesenchyme of the developing kidney. Um, either way, it's, the only thing to remember is that if you have a kidney that hasn't ascended all the way up to its normal position, um, it may have an aberrant uh, renal supply, uh, arterial supply to it. It's important when you're thinking about these conditions operatively. 
Um, so if kidneys fail to ascend properly, we call it an ectopic kidney. Um, if they don't ascend at all, they'll stay down in the pelvis. We call that a pelvic kidney. Um, and if they, um, and if the inferior poles fuse, so they come across together in the midline and fuse, you get what's called a, a horseshoe kidney, as can be seen in part D here in this figure on the top. Um, so here's another in-service alert. This is a question that um, both pediatric urologists like to quiz uh, residents on, but also could show up on, on an exam. So the fused lower pole of the horseshoe kidney is trapped by which of the following structures during the ascent? A, inferior mesenteric artery, B, the superior mesenteric artery, C, the celiac artery, or D, the common iliac artery? And the answer here is the inferior mesenteric artery. Um, if you think about it, if this kidney is ascending up from the pelvis, the first thing it would hit really is the IMA, and that's where it would get trapped. Um, so another question in renal ectopia, the most common place for the ureter of the ectopic kidney to enter the bladder is where? A, in a more cephalad and lateral position. B, when ectopia results in a cross kidney, the ureter enters on the cross side, so ipsilateral to that other kidney, the normal one. C, in a normal location in the trigone, or D, in a more caudal and medial position. And the answer here is in normal location in the trigone. So that's really important to remember, especially in a crossed uh, kidney. Um, so here, just to finish that thought, so kidneys, not only can they fail to ascend, can they form a horseshoe kidney, but you can actually have a kidney come over to the opposite side of the body and stay there, an the ectopic cross kidney, or you can even have it fuse, so a lower pole of that crossed kidney will fuse, sorry, the upper pole of that crossed kidney will fuse to the lower pole of the normal kidney, and you have what's called cross fuse ectopia. Um, so the actual incidence of of ectopia, renal ectopia varies in the literature from anywhere between 100, oh, sorry, one in 500 to one in 2000. Or, so it's pretty common. Um, average occurrence is about one in 900. It doesn't seem to be affected by gender. Um, the left side is favored slightly over the right for ectopia. We don't know necessarily why. And pelvic kidneys are estimated to occur in about one to two to one to 3,000 patients. Um, the ureter, again, important point to remember, enters the bladder on the ipsilateral side with its orifice positioned normally, except for the rare cases where you could have an ectopic ureter with an ectopic kidney. Um, the ectopic kidney, um, it's important to remember, is usually smaller um, than the normal size and it can have some fetal lobulations still with it. Um, the renal pelvis is usually more in an anterior position instead of medial, medial to the parenchyma and uh, usually there is some form of incomplete malrotation. 56% uh, um, in one study of ectopic kidneys did have some hydronephrosis or some dilation of the collecting system. Um, and uh, reflux um, is thought to occur in maybe up to 30% of children with ectopic kidneys. Um, the, the interesting thing also is that um, these renal ectopic kidneys uh, and topia are associated often with genital abnormalities. Um, incidence um, in the literature varies from 15 to 45 percent, um, and we'll talk a little bit why that could be the case when we talk about um, more of the mesonephric duct in the, in the genital tracts. Um, so malrotation, so not only do the kidneys ascend, um, but they also are going to rotate. So they're going to start out like an A, sort of with the pelvis facing forward, um, and then as they go up, they're going to rotate like this, so the pelvis face is more in a medial location. So this ventromedial rotation um, is going to occur simultaneously with this ascending or this migration up. Um, they rotate about 90 degrees, so in B is what we expect the kidney to look like, um, and their malrotation can occur in any direction. So you can actually have an under-rotated uh, kidney, you can have an over-rotated kidney as in D, a completely over-rotated kidney as in E, or you can have a hyper-rotation in the reverse direction um, as in F. And these um, all can affect um, how the blood supply goes into the kidney, but also how the um, ureter and the pelvis, um, the positioning, important for if you're doing any uh, percutaneous stone cases or if you have to do a parsonephrectomy to know sort of the rotation of that kidney. Um, and that rotation is pretty common, um, as we talked about as well, about one in, one in four to five, four to 900. Males are frequently more common. Um, it has been seen in Turner syndrome, something just to remember. Um, there are no specific sort of other abnormalities seen in these kidneys. There doesn't seem to be too much of a higher risk of hydronephrosis or obstruction. You can get it as you can get in any kidney, but there's not really an increased risk. Um, but you can sometimes have uh, a UPJ obstruction if there's an aberrant accessory artery. But the prognosis in the long term is, um, is usually normal function for these kidneys.
and there's a picture of that side. So we've taken care of this, this half of the picture and now we're on this side. And then so adrenal, here's another um, in-service alert. So if you guys are sort of draining out, you can start to, to think about what's going on now. So um, it's actually, sorry, this is in the wrong spot. I apologize for that. But um, here's a question of 14 year old girl, primary amenorrhea, and she's a 25th percentile right and web neck, karyotype is 45 XO, so Turner syndrome most likely, genital abnormality, um, is either renal genesis, horseshoe kidney, BUR, UPJ obstruction, or vaginal genesis. I already clicked forward, but it was uh, it's a horseshoe kidney. Um, the adrenal glands. Um, so the adrenal glands, important to remember, um, they also begin to develop in about three to four weeks. Again, um, we are now seeing many things that are occurring um, in this four, five week period. So these events are sort of happening simultaneously. Um, the Adrenal, uh, the adrenal glands um, begin um, by migration of cells um, in the fifth to sixth week um, that form these adrenal gonadal ridge. Um, and so it's a pro common precursor to both not only the adrenal glands and the adrenal cortex, but also the gonads. So this, these cells that migrate um, to the cranial end of the mesonephros, remember you had the mesonephros, the mesonephric duct. So just above this, you're gonna have these adrenal gonadal ridge, these cells. Uh, from the clinical epithelium that are condensing, um, and then they're going to form the top part of that, the adrenal cortex, and then the bottom part of that will eventually form the gonads. Um, so again, things that are happening simultaneously in similar areas. Um, between 8 to 10 weeks, the uh, mesenchymal cells will form a capsule around this cortex. There are two types of cells that then migrate in. There are neural crest-derived cells, um, and these will form, uh, these come medially to the cortex and will form the adrenal medulla. Um, there are two cells, as I said, so the neuroblasts uh, form, uh, there are two types of neural crest derived cells. Neuroblasts, which form the sympathetic chain, and some of them actually do migrate and will become part of the adrenal medulla. Um, and these are the cells, important to remember, especially from a pediatric standpoint, that will, can form a neuroblastoma. So you can get a neuroblastoma anywhere along the sympathetic chain, but also in the adrenal gland because of these neuroblast cells. The second type of derived uh, neural crest cells are the chromaffin cells, and these are important cells. So remember, um, they're the predominant cells in the adrenal medulla. They um, are the ones responsible for epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine release, and these are the ones that can form uh, few cyt uh, cytochromas. The uh, adrenal glands, um, important to remember, start out in their normal location, so they don't migrate. So if you have renal agenesis or renal ectopia, you don't have a kidney on the side, but you're your adrenal gland is actually in the, or sorry, if you, if you have ectopia, so your kidney's in the wrong spot, the adrenal gland is in the normal spot of the orthotopic position. So the adrenal glands, that's a question that comes up on the in-service, and that was the question that I thought I had before, so I apologize for that, but um, in essence, if there's renal genesis or ectopia, where do you expect to find the adrenal glands? And the answer is in the normal spot. Um, the adrenal gland may not be like that triangular shape, and it may be more circular than a spheroid than, as than expected, but um, it still should be in that location. Um, another important embryological point is that there are um, extra adrenal um, chromaffin cells. So the most common area for them is something called the organ of Zuckerland, Zuckercand, and this is um, in the aortic bifurcation area. And so you can have a pheo that's extra, extra adrenal. Um, the classic teaching is that is about 10%, although those numbers may not uh, hold up anymore. But these um, can happen again at the aortic bifurcation or even in the bladder. When they're extra adrenal, sometimes they're also called paragangliomas. Um, another important point um, is our adrenal rest. So, um, and this actually gets back to the fact that there's an adrenal gonadal um, ridge there. So, because the kidney or the, the adrenal glands and the gonads are forming in such close proximity and the gonads gonna eventually descend down, you can have adrenal rests, which are ectopic uh, adrenal cortex or med uh, medulla tissue that can be found anywhere along that length of gonadal descent. Um, and in seven and a half uh, to 15% of neonates, neonates there are um, adrenal rests that are associated with a gonad. These will almost in the majority of cases regress on their own, but they do persist in about 1% of adults. What you may see um, doing an orchiopexy or a hernia repair, so it's on the pede side, is these little yellow sort of pearly looking um, circles, and those are the adrenal rests. So it's an easy uh, sort of pop quiz in the operating room that you might get, but um, the answer there is we see this along sort of the spermatic cord or even near the, the, 
the testicle during the work epexy, um, their adrenal rests. Um, one thing to, to note as well, um, in males, uh, boys with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, these adrenal rests uh, often persist inside the testicle itself. This is an ultrasound down here. Uh, they're present in almost 50% of males with CAH, and they can form something called a testicular adrenal rest tumor or TART. Um, these grow uh, because of uh, ACTH stimulation, um, and they can actually lead to some damage to the seven nephrostugals and even obstruction. It can lead to uh, issues with fertility. Um, treatment for these, these TARTs is actually steroids, the dexamethasone, um, and that can reduce the size and lead to complete regression uh, resolution. Okay, so we're going to move on to the bladder and the ureter. So the urogenital sinus, important um, to remember this now as well. So the, by the third week gestation, again, third week, a lot of things going on, you have the cloacal membrane, uh, which is composed of both ectoderm and endoderm. Now, this um, area, by the fourth week, the neural tube and the tail is extending dorsally and caudally, so the cloacal membrane um, and the cloacal uh, flips over a little bit more to the ventral side. Um, as it does that, the terminal portion um, is called the cloaca, um, and it's an endoderm lined, um, and then the yolk sac will dilate, dilates and forms this cloaca portion. The cloacal membrane um, sits between them, and um, by the fifth to sixth week, this cloacal, this cloaca um, is thought to be divided um, into an anterior portion, which is the urogenital sinus, and a posterior portion, the anorectal canal. Um, now, the, for how this forms and sort of the theory that's uh, been proposed is the ranke turex theory. Um, and the idea there is that you actually have what is called the rectal, urorectal septum that forms by a midline fusion of two lateral ridges within the cloaca itself. And this descends down and touches the cloacal membrane. Um, this theory has been put to question um, recently. And so some people have kind of challenged this classical view. But it's kind of an easy way to conceptualize how this may happen. You have a cloaca which drains the, the rectum um, and the vagina in the female and the urethra. And then this, this um, septum comes down, separating the anal rectal canal from the urogenital sinus. Um, and the urogenital sinus is going to become uh, the uh, vesicle urethral canal, which is going to be the future bladder and the pelvic urethra. Um, it's also where the, the mesonephric ducts are going to insert. Um, and then the urogenital sinus um, down below is going to be your phallic urethra in the males or the vaginal uh, vestibule in the females. Um, again, so this classic view has sort of been challenged. Um, and there's thought now that congenital cloacal and anal rectal malformations develop actually from an abnormality of initially this cloacal membrane and how it, how it forms. Uh, but important just from an embryological standpoint to realize that everything starts out as one chamber. So if there's any error in how this chamber is dividing into the vagina, the bladder, urethra, and the you know, rectal area, you can have connections between the two. So in a male, you can have a rectoprostatic fistula. Um, in females, you can have a full cloaca where all three are coming together in this middle picture. Um, and then you can also have a rectovaginal fistula if you've separated out the uh, urogenital, the, uh, the vesicle, vesicle uh, vesicle urethral channel. Um, so the next thing to talk about, and this is also important, especially when we start to think about duplicated systems, um, is how the uteric bud um, enters, uh, enters the bladder. And so by about day 24, we talked about this mesonephric, these Wolvian ducts, they're going to join the urogenital sinus, uh, again, separated out from the cloaca. By about day 33, the distal portion of this, these mesonephric ducts, which is sometimes called the common excretory duct, sometimes it's called the common nephric duct, it's going to dilate and become absorbed into the urogenital sinus, um, as seen in by this red arrow, this sort of this blue area. So there's some thought that this um, becomes the trigone, and so it's actually a sort of an incorporation of the mesonephric duct distally into the bladder. Um, that has been challenged in the next slide. We'll talk a little bit about that. But the important thing and to look at sort of on this first image here is that your mesonephric duct connects to the urogenital sinus. Your uteric bud is coming off, which is going to form the metanephros um, in the kidney. And so as that gets incorporated into this urogenital sinus, this uteric bud connection gets pulled into the bladder, and then it'll stop at the top part of the trigone, 
but the mesonephric or the wolverine duct continues to get migrated down and to the bottom and actually goes to where the vera montana will be in a male. And so again, that's gonna be the vas, and that's gonna connect to so no vesicle, and that's gonna to connect to the, the vera montana. So as this gets pulled down, you can see that if there's any ectopia with where that uteric bud comes off, you may have a misalignment of how the ureteral orifice is or where it's located, complete ectopia. Um, so in terms of the sort of challenges to this, this sort of uh, original theory behind how the uteric buds uh, got incorporated, um, I had the pleasure of working with Kathy Mendelson at Columbia. I mean, she did some really incredible work looking at these cell lines, um, especially uh, in mice, um, and how they got incorporated into the bladder. And what she noticed was that, so this urogenital sinus, here's your nephric duct, which is the same as the mesonephric duct, um, and this is your uteric bud coming off. It does get incorporated into the urogenital sinus in that trigone area, but actually all these cells undergo apoptosis um, and go away. And so the bladder trigone itself is really made up mostly of bladder cells. Um, and so um, this sort of question, that original theory, what she noted also was that the Wolvian duct and the ureter form this loop, um, which is really important in how it incorporates into the bladder and the timing of this loop and the spatial um, position of this loop are important in ectopic ureters. Um, as we'll talk about. Um, so initially, um, another thing that Dr. Mendelson noted was that this, this connection of where the, where the common nephric duct is incorporated into the urogenital sinus is actually occluded by cells. And so these cells then undergo apoptosis, but if they're persistence, could this be a, what forms a ureter seal, the chwala's membrane? And so that's just an important point that sort of as this is incorporated, if these cells that form an obstruction there don't go away, um, it could form it possibly an obstruction. Um, so this is an insert alert because this is a topic that comes up quite often um, in the, about the positioning of the different ureteral orifices. So in a duplicated system, um, the upper pole ureter, uh, sorry, the lower pole ureter, ureter um, is, is gonna be incorporated um, sooner. So the lower pole, which incorporates too low on the mesonephric duct, gets incorporated early as that mesonephric duct gets incorporated into the bladder. And so this leads to that ureter being usually in a, in a caudal, higher, in a more lateral position. Um, and that can lead, um, as we'll see in a little bit, to a uh, higher incidence of reflux. The upper pole, and just getting back sort of this picture, the upper pole ureter will stay connected to the mesonephric duct longer as it gets pulled down through the trigone to the Vera Montana. So it actually connects later in a more medial and a more uh, caudal position. And this one is the ureter, the upper pole ureter is the one that usually is obstructed um, and may have a ureter seal, that's, that's part of it. Um, again, so here it sort of shows in this picture down here, you have two uteric buds. This bottom one of the lower pole actually gets incorporated first into the urogenital sinus. So that's in a more normal position or sometimes more lateral encephalad, whereas the upper pole is actually lower down, closer to the vera montana, the bladder neck, um, can even get incorporated into the vagina in females. Um, again, so you, it's kind of the opposite of what you expect because the upper pole actually gets brought in later into that incorporation. Um, in males, the ectopic upper pole ureter can go to, as I said, the bladder neck, the vera montana, or any of the Wolvian duct structures, so even the, the vas deferens, the seminal vesicles. The uh, important thing here to note is that all of these locations are above the external sphincter, so you should not have incontinence in the male with an ectopic ureter. In a female, the ectopic ureter can insert into the bladder neck, into the urethra, or even into the, the vagina itself. Um, so when it inserts into the vagina, you can have leakage, but even in the, in the urethra, if you're below the sphincter, you can have leakage. So sometimes females can present um, later with constant uh, incontinence, and this is something that you have to think about, especially in the pediatrics. If you have a female who's never been toilet trained and is constantly wet day and night, um, think about ectopic uh, ureter. This is um, a figure from a 1975 paper by Mackie Stevens, um, and this again sort of is talking about what we were trying to say before, but basically B is your normal location, and so that gets incorporated into a normal spot in the trigone. A is a lower pole ureter, gets incorporated too quickly and actually migrates up higher up. 
um, into the lateral encephalad position. And then C, the upper pole ureter, uteric bud, gets incorporated later, and so it gets drawn down further with that mesonephric or Wolvian duct system. Um, here's the insertus alert, and this is also just sort of a, you know, something you'll need to know, especially when you do your pediatric rotations. Um, but the lower pole ureter, again, cephalad and lateral, tends to have reflux, whereas the upper pole, caudal and more medial, tends to have obstruction, a ureter seal. And I always remember this by LR, so lactated ringers, LR, lower reflux, and then UO, ureter orifice, but upper obstruction. So LR, UO, if you just remember those two things, uh, they'll get you through a lot of pediatric uh, questions. Um, so importantly, getting back now to why this is, uh, you know, what, what can happen in males. So this mesonephric or Wolvian duct, as we talked about, is going to form the vas deferens um, and the seminal vesicle. And so as it gets incorporated towards the Vera Montana, um, you can actually have some ectopia with that as well. So if it connected to the ureter instead of the rear ventana, if it doesn't sort of separate from the enteric bud, common nephric duct area, you can have, actually have a vas that connects to the ureter. Um, and boys who present with recurrent epididymitis or ipsilateral hydronephrosis, something to think about um, is the possibility of an ectopic vas. Um, the development of the ureter itself, um, we'll go through pretty quickly because not much is really understood about it um, from a molecular level. Um, we do know that there are cuboidal epithelial uh, cells initially um, and that the lumen, they start to cannulize around 28 days, four weeks. Again, that four week period. Um, there's transient obstruction, we think, and then a recannulization occurs. We think this occurs from the middle of the ureter and it progresses sort of both a caudal and a cranial fashion. Um, and we know that um, distally, where the ure ureter is entering the bladder, there seems to be this membrane or this layer, two cell layer thick wall, um, uh, thick layer sort of over the UO um, that tends to go away um, by the 37th to 39th day. We call this Chalo's membrane. So you have a ureter seal, that's a question that somebody may ask you. Um, stop to be persistence of that. Um, urine production begins at about the 10 week period in gestation. Important to know because this is important for the ureter to develop. As the, um, as the ureter is, is seeing this uh, fluid go through it, it helps to both induce changes in the urethelium as well as probably the smooth methyl development. Um, and then by about 14 weeks gestation, you start to have urethral cells that were formerly called transitional cells. So sometimes you see that in literature as well, but urethral cells um, develop. Uh, recently, it's been noted that the renin angiotensin system, angiotensin system is very important in the development of the kidney. Um, so the, the RAS is uh, present and active during fetal life. We think it helps maintain fetal glomerular filtration um, and ensures adequate urine production. Um, we know that if you disrupt the system, you can actually have abnormal growth of the kidney and development of the kidney and the ureter. And we do know that the mesonephros and the metanephros have both subtypes of angiotensin II uh, receptors, AT1 and AT2. And uh, what's also interesting is that mothers who are on ACE inhibitors um, have increased rates of not only fetal loss, but also hydronephrosis, anuria, um, oligonephrosis, and, and renal issues. Um, so getting back a little bit to the bladder, so now by the fourth to sixth week, um, the endodermal cloaca is separating, um, as we talked about, into that urogenital sinus and the dorsal lead into the uranal rectal sinus. Um, the cradial portion of the urogenital sinus is going to become your bladder and the pelvic urethra. Uh, which in the female is the entire urethra. Um, and this, uh, by the 10th week, tenth week, you have a cylinder tube uh, structure um, that appears, uh, that tapers at the apex and forms what's called the urachus. And this is contiguous with the Allen toys, and you can see it here in this picture. Um, so you have your upper portion of your urogenital sinus as it's forming, um, and then you have your urachus that connects to the Allen toys. Um, and this, this is actually an extra embryonic cavity um, that is formed from the yolk sac. Um, and it connects to the, the dome or the top portion of the, what will be the future bladder. Um, by the fourth to fifth month of gestation, the ontoic duct will involute as the bladder descends into the pelvis. And this causes the duct to elongate and becomes a fibrinous thick band or cord that's called the urethral remembrance. Another easy test question or, or intraoperative question that you can ask is that what what is the urethral remnant or what's the medial, it's called the medial, median umbilical ligament. So that ligament that you see coming from the umbilicus going down into the bladder, uh, especially during sort of your robotic cases, you might say that is the um, urethral remnant. And so it's the median umbilical ligament as well. 
Um, important to note here is that if you have persistence of this uracal remnant or uracus, you can actually have a connection that can lead from the umbilicus all the way down to the dome of the bladder. So in some babies or in some newborns or even older, you may see urine actually come out of the belly button. Um, and this would be a persistent uh, uracus. Or you can have it close off both at the distal and the proximal end and lead to a cyst that can become infected and lead to um, cycles infection. Or you can have um, even a bladder diverticulum if the most uh, proximal portion hasn't closed up all the way. Um, the bladder will continue to develop. Um, by the 12th week, you now have bilayered cuboidal cells and smooth muscle fibers are starting. Um, they tend to start at the dome. By the 13th, 17th week, um, this, you get mature urothelial characteristics and then a four to five cell layer uh, thick urothelium by the 21st week. Um, little is known really about fetal continence mechanisms, so we won't talk too much about it. We do know the bladder empties every 15 to 20 minutes. Um, an amniotic fluid by about the 16th week of gestation is primarily fetal, an important point to know. So any uh, oligo or anhydrous after that point is probably because of any obstruction to the urinary system. Um, and bladder compliance uh, increases gradually. So actually it starts out pretty high in the bladder, what we think, and then it actually increases and gets better um, gradually through gestation, probably because to do with the urine production and sort of distension of the, of the bladder itself. So now we've taken care of that part. Um, and then we'll go into general. I know we don't have a terrible amount of time, but I'll try to get through some key points here. Um, so the genital system, again, is developing at a similar time frame. The fifth week, you have these primoidal germ cells that actually start out by the yolk sac and migrate along the dorsal mesentery to the genital ridge. Again, they're going to find those adrenal cells and form that adrenal um, genital ridge. Um, cells uh, from the mesonephrus um, and the adjacent uh, cloacal epithelium will proliferate again to form these genital ridges that are medial to the mesonephrus, uh, as you can see in this picture here. The sixth week gestation, we find that the cells of the genital ridge will invade the neighboring uh, mesenchyme and they're going to form primitive uh, sex cords. These primitive sex cords will actually start to invest around germ cells and support their development. And then you also have simultaneously the paramesonephric ducts or the malarian ducts forming, which are lateral to the Wolvian ducts. So they're out here and they develop both males and females. In males, what happens is you have a Y chromosome that produces the sex uh, uh, related Y. And so this is the gene and the protein that are important for development of the Sertoli cells. Initially at around six weeks, these Sertoli cells will help form what's called testis cords. And these are the precursors uh, to the seminiferous tubules. They cannulize after birth. Um, this is uh, all happening around seventh week of gestation. And the basement membrane formed between these Sertoli cells, the germ cells, and the mesenchymal fibroblasts is all this blood testis barrier that we talk about. The distal testis cords, so these initially these primitive cord cells, which have, um, will start to uh, form what's called the ready testes, and these will form uh, connections with those residual tubules of the mesonephric ducts that we talked about that are the efferent ductules. About five to 12 of these will connect together to form uh, connections. Um, important here to note is that their Sertoli cells also secrete malaria inhibiting structure uh, substance, or, uh, and this is, um, done in a local and ipsilateral fashion. So when you think about genital development internally and externally, internally remember that all of these effects happen on a local and an ipsilateral side. So the Sertoli cells are making MIS, that's gonna cause regression of the paramesonephric or the malarian structures uh, by about eight to 10 weeks in the males, but only on the side of that gonad. So if you have DSD in terms of one gonad on one side, an oval testicular case, um, only on the side with the Sertoli cells in that um, the Y chromosome and the testis, will you have MIS and regression of these paramesonephric ducts. Um, in the malarian structures, and these are sometimes questions that come up during, again, during sort of scrotal cases, um, the cranial extent of the malarian remnant is the appendix testis. Uh, we always ligate these because these can twist and cause torsion and sort of other uh, pains um, for, for children and adults. Um, and the caudal extent, so on the opposite side completely, is the prosthetic utricle, which is a little outpouching uh, in the prosthetic urethra that um, can lead to sometimes stasis of urine infections if they're very large. But these are all malarian remnants. In the absence of uh, MIS, you have persistence of the paranesonephric ducts in the female. Um, and we'll get to that, what that forms in a little bit. But if you have um, either a failure to make MIS from the Sertoli cells because of a genetic change, 
or they're unresponsive, there's, so there's no receptor for them in these uh, paramesonephric ducts, then you can have persistence of the malarian duct structures, and this can uh, be a condition called hernia ura inguinale, where you actually have herniation um, uh, of, either, of your uterus um, in an otherwise male uh, patient. Um, by the ninth to 10 weeks, the latex cells um, have differentiated from those in kind near the genital ridge um, in response again to the SRY, and these lytic cells are going to produce testosterone starting around the ninth week, um, again, probably to the twelfth at least, and these are going to help uh, locally and ipsilaterally keep the mesonephric or the Wolvian ducts alive and make them into the epididymis, the vas, and the seminal vesicles. So again, an ipsilateral local effect. So if you have a testis on one side, you're going to get rid of those paramesonephric ducts but you're going to, and keep the mesonephric ducts, but on the other side, if there's an ovary, you'll have the opposite effect. These effects don't don't go systemically, they're locally. So I like to think of this as sort of the testosterone and the MIS coding those mesonephric ducts and the paramesonephric on the side that, of that gonad. Um, initially, testosterone is regulated by placental uh, gonadotrophin, but eventually it's regulated by the fetal pituitary gland. And in the male, the wolving duct remnants are the appendix epididymis and the paradidymis. Um, prostate develops from the urogenital sinus, um, so it's a little bit different than the other organs that we talked about, vas and seminal vesicles. Um, it starts at the 10th to 12th week as an outpouching and outgrowth of the uh, urogenital sinus. Um, these epidural cords forms prosthetic bud, and there's similar mesenchyme epithelial interactions that are occurring that we talked about sort of with the kidney development. Um, important to know is that the prostate and the bulbal urethral glands, again, urogenital sinus, testable question, and they're DHT dependent. So they require alpha, 5-alpha uh, reductase, and they take systemic testosterone and make it into DHT. Whereas the seminal vesicle in the vas, again, we talked about was a local and an ipsilateral effect dependent on testosterone. In the females, the primitive sex cords will degenerate because there's no SRY. The mesothelial cells of the general ridge will then form secondary cortical uh, sex cords, which will form the ovarian follicles. And these germ cells, um, they go through germ cells to oogonia and then primary oocytes. They arrest in meiosis, meiosis uh, first phase of meiosis. Um, and at about uh, 20 weeks gestation, females will have the maximum number of oocytes that they'll ever have in their life, and it's 7 million. By about birth, they have, it's down to 1 to 2 million of primary oocytes, and these don't go back into meiosis until puberty. Um, in females, you have the absence of MIS and the androgens. Um, again, local and ipsilateral effect, and this will lead to the degeneration of the mesonephric bolivian ducts because there's no testosterone, and then persistence of the malarian ducts because there's no MIS. Um, and the malarian duct structures in the female will form the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and then the upper two-thirds of the vagina. There's some debate about if it's four-fifths or two-thirds, but needless to say, the upper part of the vagina. Um, and then, again, the, the persistent structures from the mesonephric duct in females um, we talked about, but the euphrones, uh, parafrons, and then garter duct cysts. Um, distally, so the paramesonephric ducts, um, these malarian structures, distally will actually adhere to each other and then contact the wall, posterior wall of the urogenital sinus. Um, this will form the ureteral vaginal canal at about the third uh, month of life. These fused portions um, will eventually, uh, the unfused portions of the top parts are what's going to form the fallopian tubes and the infundibulum next to the ovaries. Um, the sinovaginal bulbs will then form from the endodermal uh, tissue. Um, as part of the urogenital sinus. Um, I think there's a picture of that right down here. So you have the sinovaginal bulb coming down here, and that actually will end up forming the lower one-third of the vagina. So the lower one-third of the vagina, the lower portion of the vagina, is the urogenital sinus. The top part is all mesonephric, uh, paramesonephric duct. Um, the vaginal plate elongates, cannulizes. Again, a lot of these tubes all start out as full thickness, and then they will cannulize as things go on. So you can have errors in any of this process of cannulation, which can lead to septations in the vagina. Um, and then the lower end, um, again, lengthens the rest on the posterior wall of the urogenital sinus as the vestibule. And then you get the endodermal membrane that separates the vagina from the UG sinus will form the hymen, um, and that will partially regress by fifth month. Um, so we're almost done. We're just to the very last bit here. Timing-wise, I guess we're... Oh, we're doing a little bit over, sorry guys. Um, but bear with me for the last portion here. So in terms of external genitalia, we talked a lot about the internal genitalia, but externally the cloacal membrane again, is that mesoderm that migrates between the ectoderm and the endoderm layers. Um, this forms the abdominal wall as well, so there's some thought that with uh, cloacal or even uh, bladder extrophy, there's an error of, of this migration of the cloacal membrane. 
Um, by about a fifth, fifth week, the cloacal folds will develop on either side of the cloacal membrane. Um, these folds will meet in, um, in the midline anteriorly um, and form the genital tubercle. So here is your fold on either side of the cloacal membrane forming the genital tubercle. Um, after the cloaca divides, um, around the urogenital sinus, you have the urogenital folds, folds, and then you have the, around the anus, the anal folds. folds. And then lateral to these, you actually have the label, labiospural folds, folds, which will form the labia or the scrotal, um, respectively, depending on the gender. Um, so here is sort of the indifferent stages. Six all the way up to about the seventh week. So until the seventh week, everything is looking identical. You have your genital tubercle we talked about, and the cloacal folds here that are folding around the, the cloacal membrane. And then just lateral to that, you have the labioscrotal folds here. And then here is where we think of maybe that your genital, your erectal sinus coming in and touching the cloacal membrane. In the males, um, embryonic development of the penile urethra is actually quite controversial. Um, there's probably a urethra groove that's endoderm lined. Then there's a plate that possibly cannulizes and maybe even recannulizes. And then there's fusion of the urethral fold that forms, we think, the urethral, uh, penile urethra, although um, there is some debate about that. Classically, it's thought that if this uh, urethral plate doesn't fold, or the folds don't come completely over, you can have hypospadias. Um, in terms of the distal glandular urethra, um, it is a fusion of the urethral folds proximally and possibly as well as ingrowth of ectodermal cells distally. Um, there are three um, important pathways for external genitalia, especially in the male. That are, some of them are androgen independent, some are androgen dependent, so they depend on systemic androgens, um, and then some are endocrine and environmental influences. The important thing here to note is that um, sexual dimorphism in genital development externally is based on signaling through the androgen receptor. So, it's based on systemic um, testosterone and systemic androgens. So whereas in internally, it's a side effect, it's a lateral and local, for external genitalia, it's just a systemic effect. So if you have any testosterone, such as from congenital adrenal hyperplasia, and you have a lot of androgens and, and different hormones out there, you can have uh, masculinization of the, of the external genitalia just from a systemic effect. But internally, you won't have any effect. Um, so DHT, as we, all, uh, as we um, talked about a little bit earlier, is made uh, from testosterone by phthalate alpha reductase inhibitor. Um, and this is really important in terms of uh, developing genitalia. It uh, has a 10 times affinity for the androgen receptor um, and is important for forming the external genitalia. And it's important to note that by about the 12th to 13th week, the genitalia of the male fetus is completed uh, with closure of the urogenital cleft. So anything, any process that can disrupt this early in life, vanishing testis or um, any sort of environmental factors, uh, androgen disruptors that could be uh, ingested in the, in the mom can affect this process and penile um, development. In females, there's an absence of the circulating testosterone. And so the external genitalia keeps the appearance of a six week uh, gestational stage. Um, the genital tubercle will develop only slightly and form the clitoris, and then the labial, lateral labial folds will become the labia majora. Um, so this is sort of the, the two things. That, the one thing I wanted to sort of talk again about is that internally genitalia has a local and a unilateral effect of androgens and MIS. Um, we talked again about what happens. And externally, it's, it's really a systemic effect, so it's a bilateral effect of these androgens, and then it's specifically the local conversion to DHT. So in the presence of both um, androgens and uh, alpha 5 alpha reductase, you'll have the development of male external genitalia bilaterally, and then in, uh, sorry, in the presence of them. In the absence of both, you'll have the female, and if you have an absence of one, so a, sort of a 5 alpha reductase inhibitor or some uh, deficiency, or if there's any sort of mutation in the androgen receptor, you can have um, any sort of uh, spectrum of external genitalia ranging from a completely feminization to a complete masculinization. So we've taken care of that last part. And then finally, just on gonadal descent, um, again, something that's important in pediatrics, but the undifferentiated gonad is initially located high in the abdomen near the kidneys. Important to note, especially if you're doing an orchiopexy or if you have a, you know, a patient that you're seeing for an undescended testicle and you can't palpate the testicle, it can be anywhere from up by the kidney all the way down to uh, just high in the scrotum. And so uh, this process of how it comes down um, is thought to be due to several influences, uh, again, um, some of this is theoretical, uh, but there's thought that there's two ligaments that are holding the gonad in place, the cranial suspensory ligament, and then the ventral ligament, which will become the future gubernaculum. 
Um, so in the male, there are two stages of testicular stent, which is something I always try to explain to any patient, uh, any parent who's come to me with a kid with an undescended testicle, is that in the first 10 to 15, between 10 and 15 weeks gestation, so that first sort of trimester, there's a transdominal movement of the testicle. So it actually will get close down towards the internal uh, inguinal ring. Um, this is probably due to glubernacular growth. This is mostly a testosterone independent portion of descent. Um, and we think it has uh, a big influence of insulin like uh, three protein. Um, there are some uh, androgen effects in terms of regression of that cranial ligament, suspensory ligament. So that lets you then sort of release that testicle. And then in the seven to nine months of the last trimester of, of gestation, you have the descent of the testicle along the length of the process vaginalis down into the scrotum. This is a more of an androgen dependent portion, we believe, um, and causes the gubernacular to migrate. One thing that's interesting to note um, is that it's thought that the genital femoral nerve, also the innervations of the goob, can play a role in terms of gonadal descent. Um, in females, um, you have an absence of androgens, so the cranial suspensor ligament persists, holding the, the ovary in a, in a pelvic position. Um, um, this is suspended in the, within the broad ligament of the uterus. Um, the gubernacular does remain, but it thins out, and uh, it uh, becomes eventually what's known as the round ligament. And I think that's the the final final portion. There are um, this is just a I throw up here because this always sort of comes up on the in service, but something to look at me the night before the in service or the morning of, and it's just sort of the homologous of structures between male and female um, in terms of the embryological development. Probably get one or two points if you just memorize this. So let's see. I think. We have a couple, we have two minutes, so we have two questions here. Um, let's see. Does a horseshoe kidney fuse during ascent or is it already fused in the pelvis prior to ascent? It has to fuse before it gets to the uh, IMA. I don't know if it sort of happens right at the bottom where the, where the, in the pelvis itself or as they're going up, they sort of connect to each other. But as long as it happens before it, it gets to the uh, IMA level, so I'm imagining it has to probably happen lower down in the pelvis. Um, and then a question here is uh, another question. If part of the external genitalia is androgen independent, do we see any male appearance in patients with androgen sensitivity syndrome relatedly? Do we see expect lower one third? So in terms of the external genitalia, again, it's an influence of not only the androgen receptor, but DHT. Um, and so um, you can have a spectrum um, depending on where that mutation is in patients with uh, androgen sensitivity syndrome, uh, especially in the partial ones, as you can note. So it depends on, on how, but if it's a complete androgen sensitivity, they will look mostly female. Um, expectation. Yes, so. Lower one third, yes. Yep. Well, thank you guys. I uh, hope you learned something today, and uh, I'll get. I had uh, some sort of questions here that I'll put up on the slides that'll be up on the website. Um, and then I just want to leave you with um, just my email. If you have any questions um, or any feedback would be appreciated. And then um, I think this last slide, here we go. Stay safe.